All right, Acts chapter 25, and we'll read verse 1. Acts chapter 25, and we'll read verse 1. The passage is about the Apostle Paul when he is imprisoned and brought before the governor, Festus. And Festus, willing to do the Jews a service and please them, he tries to work it out where he can turn over Paul to the Jews. However, Festus is bound by the rules of the Roman government, so he has to follow along its rules. Paul, he, full, he very well knew the Roman rules, so he knew how to defend himself, how he could be able to keep surviving because the Jews wanted to kill him. Now, the Jews, they got so mad at Paul, they want to find anything wrong with him, even though Paul was in the right, and Paul, he was innocent, he wasn't guilty. But the Jews, nevertheless, wanted to kill him. The reason why is because they got offended. And Paul was wondering, what offense have I done? I've done nothing wrong. Look at Acts chapter 25 and verse 1. Now when Festus was come into the province after three days, he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favor against him that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about, and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, Caesar have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat, where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. In life, uh, people do get offended, and they have their apostle Paul to blame. Let's be honest, there are times in our lives that we can be like the Jews and we want to find an Apostle Paul to blame. Offenses come because, for one, people cannot take correction. If they hear about correction, something wrong that they did, if you entered a Bible-believing church and this is your first time and you're learning about how to do the right practice or what is the right doctrine, and then you get corrected and say, look, this is the right way to do things, sensitive people cannot take that and they get easily offended. They also feel a lot of guilt from rebuke. They have good intentions, and then they're willing to be humble and take corrections. But when they hear that correction or rebuke, they feel guilty about it. And rather than making a difference to correct that uh, pattern and that mistake, they instead let the guilt overweigh them, and they become unconfident, and they cannot do much for, for the Lord. That's what offense can do. It produces guilt as well. Offense can also come because you're overburdened with whatever sin you're struggling with and trying to get victory against or a trial that you're undergoing from the Lord and it's just too much and then you do feel offended. John the Baptist had that problem. He got offended. He got wearied that even though he's a great preacher, being in prison for many days, weeks, and months took a toll on him. People get offended from trials or temptations because they feel overburdened. I don't know about you, but do you feel that way? There are people who try to just run away from painful scenarios. If there's a tension that they must confront or some bad things that happen in their past or in their life or within the church, the solution within people nowadays is to just run away from it. If they are confronted with it, if they are... Uh, faced with the truth that this is what you must do to handle it, they don't want to think about it. 
They don't want to learn how to overcome it. They just want to forget it. They run away from pain. That's what offense comes. It comes from running away from painful things you don't want to talk about, you don't want to think about, you don't want to face. And obviously, those things can produce fear or trauma as well. When you go through some kind of offense in life, it can put something traumatic in you. And that trauma can become something so deep and so pervasive that it haunts you in your life and carries on in the future. And whenever you are supposed to do something for the Lord, you are afraid to do it because you have something traumatic back in your life. You cannot do... You cannot be strong. You cannot do new things in life because of something traumatic that happened. You cannot follow God's will, make decisions for the Lord. When God tells you this is what you must do, there are people who don't want to do it because of something traumatic. And that trauma comes from being offended, obviously. There are tensions that people go through in their own home, spouses in their relationship with each other, the children with their parents, siblings with one another or brethren within the church, or with their pastor, or even in the outside world in general. You face tensions in the workplace. You face tensions with the people you encounter in your school. And a lot of it is done because of offense. Sometimes you may be in the right, but let's be honest. In life, when we go through tensions in the home, or in the church, or even in the outside world, Sometimes you have to ask yourself, is it because I got offended? Offense comes because why? We, it's the result of a sensitive generation. Yeah. Yeah. A generation that does not like to face these kind of incidents. Right. And offense comes up very easily no matter how strong of a Bible believer you act. Why? Because you're born and you're so used to being raised in a generation that's watered down. <laughs> So, my question to you is, why are you offended? That's my title. Let's pray. Amen. Now, Father, fill within me the power of your Holy Spirit and the cleansing of your blood. Help me to make good time, but to preach very well. And uh, may this sermon help us as we end our year to face the next year. May offenses not come easily in our life so we can live our lives more in joy and peace in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Verse 1 through 2 is my first point. Provision of the offense. Provision of the offense. Notice in verse 1, Now when Festus was come into the province, in verse 2, Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul. The offense only exists, it wouldn't have even existed if the Jews did not provide that information to Festus. If they didn't provide the information, then the offense wouldn't exist at all. But it happened to exist. Paul happened to be the one to blame, and it was brought up in court just because they provided the information. Offense usually do doesn't come unless you provide information. And you have a Festus that you provide information to, like those Jews. Festus! And they provided information to Festus. Paul did this, Paul did that, and here's my offense here and there. And you have your own Festus. Festus is others. When you have an offense in your life or you're overburdened with something or some grievance, you know what, sometimes you tell it to people. Sometimes you tell it to your spouse or your best friend or someone you really trust and rely on. That's what happens with offense. You provide information to those people. Or you provide the information to yourself. This offense happened. That person did this. And this bad thing happened to me. And this hurts me. And why did God allow that? You're providing information, maybe not to others, but to yourself. The point is, there is a festus in your life, whether it be others or yourself, that you provide information to. An offense wouldn't happen to begin with if you didn't provide information. When you keep developing that information in your head, or that information keeps developing out of your mouth when you say it to people, you know what happens? It becomes more believable. And the offense becomes more real even when, there, when Paul is not the one to blame. There is no Paul to blame. 
but you feel like there is a Paul to blame in your life. There is an offense. There is an offense. Why? Because you develop that information. Preach. Offense don't exist unless you see, okay, there's this information. There's this negative thing. There's that negative yeah. thing. And then what happens, it, it creates into, man, that's so evil. Whoa. And that's so bad. I, yeah, I should be offended. That really hurt me. Usually people who don't get offended easily, they just forget about the information. They don't think about it. They just bypass it and move on with their lives. But people who are sensitive and get offended easily, oh, they take time on information. And they provide so much information that if anybody read it, you would think that, man, that's a legitimate complaint. Man, that person is truly evil that the person is offended from. It becomes more felt as you provide more information. But if you cast down imaginations, as the Bible says, and surrender it to the blood of Christ and surrender into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, there is no information. And when there's no information of negative things, the offense doesn't exist. And you wouldn't be mad and offended about something that happened 10 years ago and park on that and keep using that as your excuse for not moving on with your life. My second point is passionate of the offense. Passionate of the offense. Look at verses 2 through 3. Verses 2 through 3. Notice right here that the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul and besought him and desired favored against him. Wow. These uh, Jews are passionate about their offense. They desired for Festus to take up their case and to punish Paul. You know that these people also, it says that in verse 3, laying wait in the way to kill him. Laying wait in the way to kill him. These people's passion is, are, is so big about their offense, they're willing to wait it out. They're willing to park it there and to ponder about it. And even when time flies, they'll still keep that offense, no matter how much time passes by. Wow. They're so passionate about it. And usually sensitive people, people who get offended, they are passionate about something offensive to lay weight about, to ponder about, to park at, to keep thinking about, to keep feeling. That's what a sensitive, offended people do. Rather than giving the benefit of the doubt, they don't do that. They just let that offensive feeling remain and build up information in their mind and they would so much prefer that, even they would lay in wait for that. They would lay in wait and let that feeling develop even more and those thoughts, offensive thoughts, develop even more. They're willing to do that rather than hey, let's cut this off and let's give the benefit of the doubt. Why did this bad thing happen? You know, maybe this bad thing happened because you should have done this better. Maybe the Lord allowed this thing to happen because there's something you should be doing. Maybe it's not that person's fault. They're, that person actually intended it to be a good thing, not a bad thing. So you don't give the benefit of the doubt. You don't want to do that. You instead desire more. You're more passionate about that person's evil. That situation I went through is so painful that I, cannot, that I cannot let that thing go. And you lay in wait for that one. You don't give the benefit of the doubt. You don't make light of it. So what? Someone scoffed at you. Move on. That's not going to stop me from getting into the house of God, hearing his word, get good preaching and fellowship, enjoy fellowship with the remaining brethren and do something great for God. But they... Keep that one thing, that criticism from somebody or so-and-so, they don't make light of it. Oh, they park on that. And that builds up in for more information in their head and they desire to stay there. They don't make light of it. They don't make light of the pain. So what if there's traffic? So what if it's a long drive? So what if coming to church can be a hassle? Man, it's, it's just 
it's just going through the one hour struggle of it and then the remaining time I can just enjoy time listening to the Lord. You don't make light of it. Instead, you want to park it there, lay in wait there on. Man, that's so hard. So I'm offended. I can't go to church. It's too much, too much work and hassle. They don't take something humorous out of it, you know? So what if brother so-and-so is weird or sister so-and-so is weird, all right? That might just be their personality and you can take something humorous out of it, you know? I know that Robert's weird, I know that I'm weird, and I know Jared's weird, okay? I'm not going to let those two go, all right? So I know we're weird. But hey, you know, maybe you can just laugh about it. You know, that's just how we are. And then that's what builds more into a beautiful family. And you can see the, more of the beauty out of it. If everyone was like you, it would sure be a boring life. Thank God for different personalities. Take something humorous out of it. Well, that brother so-and-so is just weird. Maybe they could just do this better or, you know, normalize. And, and you're normal? And you're normal, huh? Come on, man. This is what, what makes us a great church. Take something humorous out of it. Yeah. Somebody may be out of bounds in the church and then people are like, oh, no. And then me, I'll just laugh it off. <laughs> it's just, it's just a, the guy just being overzealous like Simon Peter. He thinks he's from the sword of the Lord and Gideon Club, you know. It's just, you just make a lot, you just take something humorous out of it. Right. Amen. But people desire more so of, that person should have done that. Man, that really hurt me. Man, that person is such a burden, such a hassle, and they desire to lay in wait there. Take something humorous out of it, you know? You know, if uh, going to church is such a hassle with all that traffic, you know, take something humorous out of it, you know? Say, well, you know, this is a great opportunity where I can street preach, roll down the window, <laughs> shout out a verse. Make something funny out of it out of your life, all right? You, you take things too seriously. Offended, sensitive people take things too seriously. You can get some laugh out of it. You ever wonder why Randall's not offended? Because he jokes a lot, all right? So, you know, just take a little humor out of Randall, you know, and then that way you don't get offended easily, you know? Verse 4 through 5. My third point is potentials of the offense. Potentials of the offense. My second point was passionate of the offense. Now we're looking at the potentials of the offense. Look at verse 4 through 5. The Bible says, But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, which among you are able, which among you are able, Go down with me and accuse this man if there be any wickedness in him. Now, isn't that funny? Is that these Jews all the way from Jerusalem are willing to uh, wait it out, what, verse 6, you know, uh, 10 days, are willing to travel the distance to go down at verse 5. They are able to accuse this man. I find that very very eye-opening. You are able, you have the potential to accuse. You have the potential to find the offense. Why? Because I see certain patterns, what person said, and their mannerism, the way they looked at me, and the tone of voice, and then, you know, I, from what I see in the background of my life, all these bad things that happen, and I had experienced in my life in the past, and I know that this bad thing is going to happen, and you are so gifted and have the potential to be such a negative, miserable pessimist. And it's so sad you have the potential or ability to do something bad that harms your life rather than having the potential or ability to make your life happy. That's sad. That's miserable. You always look at certain signs or patterns. See something that just confirms the suspicion you always had about that situation or that person. Or the fear comes up and you're like, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to, I know, I know. Oh, I, I know you keep saying it's going to be all right, but I know that bad thing's going to happen. And then, see, I told you it happened when it happened. 
If you always fear and you always have that worry and concern, guess what? Let me promise you this. It will happen. Yeah. Right. You have to learn to let it go. Right. Yeah. You have to let it go and trust God. And then when that bad thing happens, the Lord can turn that bad thing right. into something good or not even let it happen. Right. But if you keep believing your fears, guess what? You will believe it. You are, you are, you have a high potential, 100% success rate on making your life fearful in confirming your suspicions, finding certain patterns to critique and to be negative about in your life rather than critiquing your own criticism, rather than believing in God, rather than your fear, rather than surrendering your suspicions to the Lord. Don't, wouldn't it be better to live a life with that kind of talent and ability? Right. And that way your life, when, no matter what bad things happen, you're just so happy. Yeah. And you don't feel offended. Amen. And when those bad things happen, they can just slip off of your shoulders and you just move on. Amen. Go up. It's so sad you have the potential or ability to make your life miserable. Imagine having the potential or ability to make your life happy how much your life can turn 180. Verse 6, my fourth point is pause of the offense. Pause of the offense. Notice in verse 6, And when he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. Now, as I mentioned a little bit before, but I can expound it further here, is that ten days have passed. If you're mad at someone and 10 days passed, yeah. that's a serious problem. Yeah. You're really offended. Yeah. During that pause of the offense, what, that bitterness just builds up more. That anger builds up more and you won't let it go. Come on, it's 10 days. Come on, God saved your soul from hell. Yeah. Come on, that incident that you went through is in the past. Yeah. Come on, that fight that you had with so-and-so has been years now. Yeah. Come on, man. Why are you still bitter and upset at God? God blessed your life incredibly now, yeah. right? I mean, why won't you let it go, man? Yeah. Let it go. Let go of the offense. Yeah. You're not good at letting things go, are you? You just pause on something that just hurts you, right? Laying wait desire of that feeling of the offense. Can't let it go. And you're so passionate about it that you're going to keep it. So much potential building up the ability to find further negative things in your offense. And that offense builds up so, more, so much more that you think it's an unspeakable crime that you have a right to cry about. Why pause on that thing? Look. Move on. Why stay stuck in that negative thing after all the blessings God's given to you? Yeah. He saved your soul from hell. You got yeah. eternal security. Brethren, uh, we live in a sin-cursed world. Don't you know that? Uh -huh. Brethren are imperfect. Don't you know that? Yeah. And can't you rejoice on the blessing of Romans 8, 28, that God yeah. can turn good things from, from bad things to good things? Right. I mean, if he didn't do Romans 8, 28 then you would remain in the bad things. Right. But lost people, even though they go through bad things, they move on in their life. Yeah. And they have nothing good out of it. You Christians, when you go through bad things, can get something good out of it, and wow. you still can't move on? Yeah. And you just want to pause right there. Lay in wait. Keep that offense. Keep getting offended. Keep that negative thing. Let me tell you something. That one negative thing is not worth losing all the good things in your life. The love around you, the blessings you got in your home, what God did for you in your life. Don't let your Christmas day be ruined just because of that one thing. Come on, just in, there's so much things to still enjoy in life. Let it go. Don't let that one thing ruin your life because the devil knows it and he knows that if that's going to ruin your whole life and make you miserable, he will keep using that. Verse 7, my fifth point is proofs of the offense. Proofs of the offense. If you look at verse 7, the Bible says, And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem uh, stood round about 
and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. My fifth point is proofs of the offense. They could not prove these offenses. But these offenses, look at that verse. Don't you feel like that? It's many. 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 Well, why can't you serve God anymore? Why can't you move on? Why can't you let things go? You know, why can't you reconcile with the brother or sister in Christ or reconcile with those people in your life? And then, because you don't know and, well, tell me. Oh, just a lot. Well, tell me. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, that, so uh, blah, and you just go. And then the, the information, right? It, but many. And guess what? It's grievous too. It's not light, you know. Maybe to the other person, they might think it's not a big deal, but to the person speaking, that's not light to them. When they got offended, they had a legitimate feeling, they feel like, and a legitimate right that I have every good reason to be bitter and upset and hurt. It's grievous. Offense wouldn't happen if you're not grieved. It's very grievous. God recognizes that. The Holy Spirit wrote that. The Holy Spirit knew these Jews, they were extremely grieved by what Paul did. And they felt like it was very many. But you know what God says? They can't be proven. They can't be proven. I know that you think that you can prove it, but if there's one thing I learned in life, is that when you take a mediator's position, okay? So whether you uh, are a leader of a certain group of people, and then you have to take care of a dispute within parties. So a gr great example is a judge, okay? So whether you be a court judge, or whether you be a pastor, or whether you, this is a big one, if you're a parent, and you see children, you know, fighting, okay? Then you know what you're going to learn? What you're going to learn is these people felt very hurt and they feel like they're in the right and someone else is to blame. But when you take that mediator's position, one thing you're going to learn is not a lot of it can be proven. It takes, uh, there's a famous saying, it takes two to tango. Usually it's, uh, there's fault and weaknesses on both sides. But there is not solid proof for that one individual or that Paul to blame or that situation in life. If you don't believe me, then as you uh, parent children more or you take the position of leading people, then you're going to realize either that both sides have their faults or bad things just happen in life that it can't be helped and you have no choice but to move on. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's what's going to happen. Move on. That's what's going to happen in life. If you don't believe that, then you're used to being the victim rather than leading people. Yeah. That's good. You're used to depending on people, de uh, depending on somebody to mediate on your behalf rather than taking charge, leading, or taking care of other people's problems because you're too worried about your own problems. But as you take care of other people's problems, your eyes are going to be open more and you're going to realize that there are people out there who have just as much pain as you do. And as you try to help them, you're going to realize, hey, I don't have a right to complain about my own pain and there's nothing I can do with this other person. That person and I need to learn that we just have to accept things as it, as it is and move on. Are you used to being the victim or ha have you been used to taking care of other people's problems before? When you switch these positions, then it will be eye-opening to you. My sixth point is pointing of the offense. Pointing of the offense. If you look at verse 8, while he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the uh, temple, nor yet against Caesar have I offended anything at all. <laughs> you know what Paul says? He's pointing out, look, it's not my fault in the law of the Jews, not my fault on the temple, not my fault even against Caesar. There's nobody to point fingers at right here. I have no one. Uh, I am not at fault at all. 
But you know what offend, uh, offended people usually do? They have to point fingers at something or someone. When you get offended, it's not like it just comes out of thin air. No, something hurts you or somebody hurts you. And the easy tactic is rather than resolving the issue, we just have to find someone to blame or something to blame. I blame it on my past. I blame it on my birth. I blame it on my defect or my health. I blame it on so-and-so. I blame it on so-and-so in the family, so-and-so in the church, so-and-so in the workplace. That's what happens in life. But, you know, there's no one to blame, to be honest. There's nothing to blame, to be honest. Yet, people still somehow find something or someone legitimate to blame. It happens. Why? Because I'm like you, human nature. It will come up. It's our fleshly tendency to come up with something or someone to blame. Point fingers at. But let me tell you something right here is that then let's just point blame at that person or that situation then, okay? If you want to do that, fine. But guess what? There will be another something and another someone that will offend you. There's more to come. So you know what? Be better, all right? Because just because you're able to successfully point the person out or the something out to put the blame upon and let's rectify that situation. Okay, I'm done. I can be happy now with my life and move on. Nothing will offend me. La la land. La la land. There's plenty of other somethings and someones out there that will offend you. So you know what's better? I'll tell you what's better. It's better you learn to overcome the first offense, yes. learn how to deal with that first offense so that when the second and third and fourth come, it doesn't hit you hard as much. Yep. It's better to undergo that first offense, learn how to handle it, learn to overcome it, move on with your life so that when second, third, and fourth comes down, it won't hit you as hard or you learn how to overcome it. Amen. It won't even phase you. Amen. But... When you're still upset about that first offense, your life is miserable because second offense comes, then third offense comes, then fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and you feel like that, woe, unfortunate me, I hate my own life. Why did I have to have a life like this? My seventh point is pleasure of the offense. Pleasure of the offense. Look at verse 9. The Bible says, but Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem and there be judged of these things before me? How funny is that verse 8? Paul said, I done nothing wrong. He can't point fingers at me to blame. But Festus won't let that go. He says, I got to please these Jews, those, these offended people right here. So, can you come to Jerusalem and then I can judge you over there? Offended people will be pleased, will be pleased when there is somebody who agrees with them about their legitimate offense. That brings them pleasure. You know how sad that is? It's so sad that it brings people pleasure that it's a messed up and twisted way to live. Is that when somebody goes through something hard in life, they just want to tell somebody and complain and whine about, oh, woe is me and this hurts and that hurts. And that person to empathize and then whine and complain with them. You know, a good example of that is conspiracy theorist truthers. They find so much evil in this world to get angry and complain about. You know what gives them pleasure? finding somebody else out there who's angry and complains along with them. And that gives them such pleasure in life. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, yes, we know about the conspiracies, but we have a solution. We don't have to get angry about that because the Bible already prophesied it would happen and Jesus would take care of our troubles and we'd be raptured out of here. So we're already taken care of. We're a, we can make a difference with our lives. But those people can't. Those people can't. Why? Because what gives them pleasure 
about what they're offended by, what they're angry about, what they're upset about, what they're hurt about, is just complaining, and somebody agrees with them in their complaint. That's the same thing with, uh, with not just situations, but even people. And that's how gossip develops. Gossip develops because you want to find somebody who will play along with your team and your side. And it's so strange that the two individuals never made friends with each other in church all those years until there's someone to blame. Unless there's an enemy, then all of a sudden the person in the front row becomes best friends with someone in the back row because they just keep talking bad about their enemy. You take pleasure in that. That's a twisted, sick way to live. How can you live your life in pleasure that way? Do you want your whole life to end with the fruits of the flesh? What's the fruits of the flesh? Anger, complaining, bitterness. That's how you want your whole life to end up with, the fruits of the flesh that way? You take pleasure in that? Or do you honestly think you take pleasure on the fruits of the Spirit? Amen. Don't you want your whole life to end up like that? Amen. Amen. Love. Love. Joy. Lord. Peace. Amen. Long suffering. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Amen. Don't you want your whole life to end that way? Well, if you want to, how can you live your life that way if you take... Keep taking pleasure on the fruits of the flesh here. Yeah. Anger, complaining, bitterness. That's not love. That's not joy. That's not peace. Yeah. That is definitely not long-suffering. Right. My eighth point is perception of the offense. Perception of the offense. Look at verse 10. Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. Now, if you're a Bible believer, then this is the one thing you want to hear. My eighth point is perception of the offense. Let's be honest. As Bible believers, we have a perception of so much great biblical knowledge. Knowledge that nobody else has ever had. Not the PhD schools or the Masons who want further light or the Rosicrucians with the inner dark secrets or something like that. You and I have the greatest knowledge in the world. We have a perception of these things because we have the Holy Spirit inside us and his word and it becomes incredibly eye-opening. So we should very well know ourselves. There's no, nothing or no one to blame then. You know, Paul said right here that at verse 10, you very well know Festus. You very well know there's nothing to blame or there's a fault. If you are a saved, Bible-believing Christian who knows all your doctrines, you have the greatest perception of the greatest knowledge in the world. So you should know that when these bad things happen, if you have knowledge, that's not a legitimate excuse you have, or a legitimate offense. Atheists talk about why does God allow suffering, right? And that's probably one of the hardest arguments. But you as a Bible believer, you have great knowledge of that. You have the answers for all those things. It's because of sin. So you can't blame God because we live in a sin-cursed world. So all these things just naturally happen. But thank God that we don't have to be like you going through these things and taking it in, that God can turn some of these things into good when he didn't have to. See? So because of that, we have an answer for the atheist. We have an answer when we go through pain and trial. Romans 8, 28. And you memorize it. You have great knowledge of it. You heard so much incredible preaching. You know that? And I'm not talking about myself here, okay? I'm talking about so many different preachers up here. And I believe in giving you guys the best. And this preaching is just, wow, it's a blessing. And these guys are Bible believers. Amen. And you hear so much great preaching. So you're armed with the knowledge that helped you with your suffering, with your offense, with struggles in life. Amen. What are you doing with those things? You very well know. You very well know how to handle these offenses. 
I don't have to keep preaching to you every Sunday. You should already know that. But God knows how weak your flesh is, which is why he requires this every Sunday. Right. So it comes down to this. If you have great biblical knowledge and should know how to handle the offense, that the offense shouldn't exist, how come it's not gone then? How come it's still there? If you have the knowledge, if you have the tools, and if you've been using them or applying them, or maybe you haven't. So maybe it's a deeper issue. The deeper issue is, are you even willing to let the offense go? Because no matter how great the answers are in the Bible and God can give you all the tools, he is not a Calvinist. He's not going to make you let go of the offense if you're not willing to begin with. Are you even willing to let the offense go? If you're having a hard time with even willing, do you even pray? Do you even pray? God, this hurts me so much. I can't let it go. You need to help me out. You need to intervene. I am that weak. I cannot be that strong. You need to help me out. Do you even pray to let it go? If you don't pray, if you're not willing, then I know the deeper issue behind that. The deeper issue is you don't trust God. You trust your offense more than God. That's the bottom line. You believe more in your offense, in your legitimate complaint and hurt, more than God. And no matter how God answers or intervenes or helps you out, you won't pray, you won't be willing. Why? Because I believe this more. I don't trust in you to make this into good. I don't trust in you that you're going to uh, take my offense and heal it. I, I believe this really hurts. And I should cry. I should whine. I believe in the feeling of crying and anger more than you, Father. And you believed on him for your salvation to save your soul from an eternal hell to the glories of heaven. And you can't even believe him with your life. Let me tell you something. It's a dangerous, risky, gambling life to live in having faith in your offended feelings more than God. That's a dangerous life to live in. Because those offenses, how can you trust those offenses? Offenses don't care about you. Offenses just wants to make you feel bad. Offenses will gather up other offenses and just make your life miserable. Offenses is what makes people commit suicide and there are wars going on. Yes. <clears throat> Offense is brutal. It produces slaughter, blood, murder, hatred. What a dangerous life to live. And that leads to my last point, point number nine, powerlessness of the offense. Powerlessness of the offense, verse 11. Paul says, for if I be an offender or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if this is powerful, but if there be none of these things, whereof these accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. You know what Paul realized? He says, if the offense is legitimate, if the offense is true, then you can even kill me, he says. I'm worthy to take the death penalty. But if they're not true, you know what Paul said? No man has the power to deliver me, to punish me. Amen. You know what offense is? Offenses that are false, offenses that come in life, from the flesh and your own wrong ways, they have no power in your life. What can they do? Just produce more death. Produce more hatred. Satisfy your what? Satisfy your anger, your vengeance, your thirst, your, uh, for blood. Seeing somebody get evil befallen on them or the situation that somehow it's avenged or rectified and offense has no power in your life. 
No matter how great your complaint is, this is important to understand. No matter how great your pain, your trauma, your hurt is in your life, it has no power to make a difference in your life. But Jesus Christ has the power Amen. to make a complete difference in your life. It's powerless. There is a power you have never even expected with God. I promise you that. As you live for Him and follow Him, sure, you might feel like there are some letdowns or God doesn't seem to intervene, but you'd be surprised that at those moments then He, ex he meets it up, then He exceeds your expectations, and then you're on high on cloud nine and you're like, wow, what a wonderful God I serve. It's a miracle I'm even alive. You have no idea the power that's behind joy. The power that's behind forgiveness. The power that's behind faith in God more than your offense. The power that's behind following His will rather than yours. You have such false expectations in the power of God, don't you? And you have such high expectations in the powerlessness, the powerlessness of your offense. Offense has no power. You can park it there, you can wait there, you can keep it, you can be passionate about it, you can find any legitimate right to complain it, but guess what? It will have absolutely zero power to make a difference in your life. Compared to Jesus Christ. Amen. When you say, God, I let it go. Yeah. God, will you heal? God, help me get over yeah. it. God, yeah. help me forgive. Lord, give me joy, not pessimism. Help yeah. me to have peace, not worry and fear. There's so much power that yes. it will transform your life beyond what you can even expect. Yes. Yes. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Try the power of God. Every head bow and every eye shut. The altar call is open.